Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Alag, Dr. Thorat, uh, Professor Biswas. Uh, welcome, all of you, uh, to this dialogue on the future of cooperatives in India. I now hand it over to Professor Saswata Biswas. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Srivas. Thank you. And uh, welcome to all the, the viewers of the audience. I think uh, they're joining in. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe, Ishivant? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, what is your expectation? What has been the registration? Do you have any number, any, any idea? Yes, sir. We have uh, around 200 uh, registrations. Okay. They're, they're joining, so you will have to let them in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think as we proceed, and they will they will be joining in. Huh? And uh, uh, do, do you think that we wait for another three minutes? So we could wait for one more minute. I think we should okay. uh, hit a good number by then. Okay. Okay. So, on behalf of the uh, Korean Centenary, uh, Work Centenary Celebration Committee, I, I welcome all of you uh, to this afternoon's uh, discussion on futures of cooperatives in India. And I also take this, and today, for the discussion, we have two very distinguished guests. And uh, um, I think uh, all of you know from Irma, anyone who has been in Irma would know Professor Alad, and uh, also uh, Dr. Dorat, who has been part of Irma for some time. And um, sir, welcome to both of you this afternoon's Thank you. discussion. Thank you. And uh, uh, we were just discussing, and uh, as I told you that uh, Salak needs no introduction in Irma, but for the benefit of the new students, because some of our freshers have also joined, some others have joined. So Professor uh, Alag, was, uh, he is now also he's professor. A professor is a professor, lifetime professor. He is also professor. <laughs> a professor never retired. So Professor Alag is a Emeritus uh, um, Professor at the Sardar Patel Institute of Economic and Social Research in Ahmedabad. And uh, he has been an academic and noted economist. Many of you must have read many of his reports. A noted economist, um, was a union minister, an administrator, a policy maker. And uh, in fact, uh, if, if I uh, you know, recount all the positions that uh, he has held so far, all very important positions, uh, I think we will not have time for the discussion. So, Mr. Carter thought that, but he has taught in the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Uh, he, uh, he, has, uh, he has also taught in the University of Pennsylvania. He, has, he obtained his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, after that, uh, uh, he, he had worked in government in many positions, and he, he was a member of planning commission. Um, he was, I already told you that he was in minister, and he has been a consultant for FAO, UNDP, ILO, World Bank, ADB, UNESCO, you name it. And he was there. Very, and one of the most important things today I would like to tell about him, that he has very closely interacted with Dr. Kurian. He has a view of Dr. Kurian, his work, which many of us had never chance to see that. So that's one thing. And he was invited to chair a very high-powered committee on the future when we are talking about this conversion of cooperatives to business companies. And he, he chaired that committee. Uh, which was later, uh, that committee's report was tabled in the parliament that uh, then the Companies Act was amended uh, to introduce these cooperative companies. Mm. So therefore, Dr. Alag has played, and I, I see well, um, somewhere, we, I think I, we have written about, some people have written about it, that in the 100 years of, uh, I think it was 1912, it was amended, the Cooperative Act was amended. And after that, in 2012, sir, if I am not wrong, it was 2012 uh, that That's your correct. committee had uh, uh, tabled that, that uh, report come out. So it, it took 100 years 
and after 100 years, uh, such a revolutionary change was brought in. And we started researching on what we call is a new generation cooperative. And that's, that was started by uh, Professor Alag and his thinking and his group. So, sir, welcome you to this uh, discussion, panel discussion. We have Dr. Thorat. Dr. Thorat is a polymath. He has been a political scientist, an economist, philosophy, has taught philosophy. And um, so he, he started, as I think he graduated in politics, he had graduated in political science, with political science. But later on, he joined the central bank. He has been, a, he had been a central banker for a long years. And I think the last position he had in RBI was executive director. And before he moved uh, to National uh, Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development as uh, first managing director and uh, then as chairman. But uh, at the same time, he, he has been an academic. He is a, someone says that he's a teacher at heart. And he has taught at many places, at many places, including Oxford. He was a, a visiting professor at Oxford University. And uh, he has held a Many he has worked in uh, World Bank also, and he has been he has been a consultant to many uh, top international organizations uh, in India abroad. And of course, another very important thing he has done, which I will talk about later in the discussion, and maybe will that I will use as a trigger to 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 to, to nudge him to talk about something else. <laughs> so so with this. Introduction. I I I, I um, invite Professor Alag uh, to um, start kickstart the discussion, sir. Uh, there's a future uh, cooperative. Yes, sir. Thank you, Where Professor you Shashwat. What you have said about me is more a reflection of our friendship rather than any qualities that I may have. But I'm very grateful to Irma for asking me to relive the memory of my friend and senior, the late Varghese Kurian. Um, actually, what I'm going to talk about the future of cooperatives will be through Kurian's eyes. In 1999, we had something called the Anand meeting, which looked at the future of cooperatives. And there was an Anand declaration. And after that three-day meeting was over, Kurian said, uh, Yoginder, come and have a coffee with me. So I went along. And uh, he said, you know, what Lal Bahadur Shastri wanted me to do has failed. Because in cooperatives all over India, they don't have a Tribhuvan Das Patel and they don't have Vargis Kurians. So you have these bandicoots who are more interested in lining their own pockets. So, Yogin, then I'm thinking that we should make companies out of cooperatives. So that's the origin of the idea of farmer producer companies. There are two things in farmer producer companies. One is that they must have annual elections, which all companies do have. The second is that their accounts must be audited. And both of these would mean that the bandicoots would stay away. And so I chaired a committee which drafted the farmer producer company amendment act to the company's bill now at that stage the thing got a lot of bad press because i don't believe in i'm not a very good communicator as far as the print media is concerned i don't when i'm doing my work i do my work rather than bothering about what one or the other correspondent to say. So these people went to Sonia Gandhi, it was a Congress government, and said, Madam, wo alag to 
कोऑपरेटिव की कंपनियां बना रहा है सो शी सेड अच्छा इट्स वेरी बैड आई नो डॉक्टर अलग इज मेकिंग अ मिस्टेक इन इज डूइंग दैट सो समबडी टोल्ड मी दैट सोनिया हैज बीन ब्रीफ्ड एंड शी विल टेल प्रणब मुखर्जी हु इज लुकिंग एट योर एक्ट एंड इट विल नेवर मेक see the light of day so i asked for an appointment at number 10 janpath and i went and told her that this is what it was and then she told pradam mukherjee that no she wrote a letter to him please give dr alag a hearing so uh that is the origin of the second amendment to the company's bill now we wanted it in the company's affairs ministry and not in the agriculture ministry because in the agriculture ministry you know it's still a part of the old colonial tradition the collector the sp and the agriculture development officer were all a part of the evening gymkhana drinks cloud now company's affairs has its own problems but at least there is a tradition of reporting audit and acceptance of that with their own auditors and so we put it in the the the, the farmer producer companies act in the ministry of corporate affairs and then they started very hesitantly i got a telephone call since i'm the granddaddy of the bill every time there is a farmer producer company they call me so this fellow called me up and he said sir i am in uh, calicut and my uh, i'm there on the london coffee exchange so that's the kind of thing which was happening but uh, thorat sahab will forgive me they were not getting any money so there was hardly any power producer company which could do anything because the entire financing business was linked up to cooperatives and uh, farmer producer companies were not there in the law and they are very much a law group with a lot of difficulty courier net been able to get self help groups to get funding but not from a producer companies so then kya kare to lobby karenge so the boston consultants were doing a future study for nabard so i went and lobbied with arun mayra who is an old friend of mine and they put it in that nabard should also have a special fund for farmer producer companies and they suggested that that should be 400 crores now we are getting pretty close to 2012 and uh, pradhan came into the act uh, they even then you know at the state level there were always problems so nitin desai who is my friend and used to be with me in the planning commission and uh, my favorite story about kurian and nitin is nitin was heading the project appraisal division at that time and kurian had prepared a proposal on uh, nddb building a a shrikhand plant in baroda and uh, the pad said no so we were having uh, dinner at mr h m patel's house and kurian turned to me and he said yogendra can you help me some fellow called nitin desa i said okay i'll arrange a meeting for you with him you come when you come to delhi you let me know so he came and nitin started giving him all these lectures on so many halwais who makes shri khand will get unemployed so kurian as you remember was a man of very few words he looked up in the eye 
And he said, your name is Nitin Desai, no? So Nitin Desai said, yes. He said, Nitin Desai, you don't know how to milk a cow and you are giving me lectures. So that was the end of that. And we persuaded Nitin to let through the NDDB's plant there. So, uh, but still at the state level, there were problems. Pradhan, at my advice, called a meeting. Narendra was there. And uh, we had all the states. They talked about their problem. And we set up a committee under Nitin Desai, which Pradhan would fund. And they would go to each state and they would sort out their problem. They're simple problems like if you're a farmer producer company, you want to register it, you go to the registrar of cooperatives and he asks you to sit outside the door, but not if you are a, a cooperative czar. So we were able to get Nitin to talk to chief secretaries and agriculture production commissioners and cooperative production commissioners and so on. And gradually we broke down the resistance. Their experience was with Pepsi Cola and we had to tell them that the Korean businesses, they will develop, they the act did allow power producer companies to develop strategic partnerships with, with corporates. But basically corporates who are interested in Indian agriculture and in agro-based industry and you know in in what is called first stage processing in transport and things of that kind. And uh, those should be funded. So gradually we were able to break down the resistance because the memory of the PepsiCo and the potatoes was still there. Actually, the big push in the farmer producer companies has come with those who are linked up with the corporates. I'm not sure how Korean would react, had been there, would have reacted to that. Possibly, since he was a Tata man, it all starts in a place called Pudukotai in Tamil Nadu, where they had uh, the new technology in growing pulses, which was able to raise the yield from about five to six quintals to around two tons. And they gave that technology to the farmer. This was Rallis, which was a subsidiary of uh, Tata Chemicals. And uh, assure the farmer a price through farmer producer companies. Tata said, we will buy it. Now, if you go and ask Mrs. Biswas, or Ushaji, when she goes and buys a pulse, she buys a, of course, uh, Yashwant is a distinguished director of Tata, he used to do that before him, so he knows this. Uh, you buy the Aishakti pulses, and the origin of that is linked up with farmer producer companies. So now, they are getting uh, uh, they are getting into the game. Um, are they Korean type of cooperatives? Because Korean believed in cooperatives which did everything. Not always. Sometimes they are. There is a farmer producer company called Sayadri. And the man who runs it has set up, this is in the Sayadri, in the, the other side of the ghats. And he has got his farmers to get out of cane into grapes and to horticulture. And he's now exporting all over the world, United States, England, 
even Latin America. And he said, you know, sir, I want to come and meet you. So he came and meet me. And he brought some grapes along. So there are, but these are a few examples, not many. In many cases, they are not this sort of overarching Korean type of cooperatives. They are limited cooperatives with limited objectives. Packing, storage. Yeshwant and me were in a company called Star Agri, which uh, later on got into some bad business. But initially it started by building storages in the private sector. And they would give a perchi, uh, a loan, using the perchi as a collateral, which was a very brilliant idea. And the uh, Singapore uh, public sector company, which buys shares all over the world, bought 25% of their shares. Uh, so you have these farmer producer companies doing limited things storages, transport, first stage processing. So there are both kinds. A few which are the grand design Korean cooperative, many which are not. I think uh, in Saurashtra, NDDB is now setting up the grand design a farmer producer company which will do dairying, which will get into pedas, which will get into everything. Others will be some fruit, some transport. I think that is something to be liked rather than, uh, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom. Let people cooperate for their own needs uh, as you go along. Uh, another area which is, I think, where farmer producer companies are getting into the act is uh, my son Munishala has written a book on this. This is a, a, a Muslim chief priest of the Shias who has set up something called Hati Mart, which is a cooperative which works in villages. It has branches all over Gujarat. It goes up to the border of Rajasthan and the Hati Mart backs them up with uh, supplies from Hati Mart in uh, Vaishala out just in the outskirts of Ahmedabad city. Um, that's a good thing. It's let there be those kind of cooperatives, let there be other kinds of cooperatives. Now, of course, Korean's dream is becoming a part of the farm trade laws, the farm laws which were passed. Unfortunately, without any debate, and so on one day, on the last day of parliament, they were slammed through with the opposition out there. So that has led to a lot of uh, controversy. Uh, I think they should have consulted people like Ramesh Chand. Who incidentally has there is a Niti Ayog document now, which is a kind of framework with which you can implement the, the farm producer companies, the AMC reform, and the direct benefit transfer. It came out in 2019, but it's not the date. I mean, it, 
You can't do these things when you have a pandemic. Because the heart of the pandemic is that trade channels are, are broken. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. Lives are important. Uh, Shasso talked about Viswa of Russell. If you're dead, then, you know, you can't come back. If you're still alive, then someday you will come back. You don't have to be a Russell to understand that. But we don't have to implement them this year. I think that is a mistake. Because as long as there are lockdowns, there will be no trade. If there is no trade, then this legislation doesn't have any feet. It doesn't have any substance. It remains on the books. So you must let the milk train go from Nashik to Mumbai, the grapes to start going over the ghats again, from Mesana to Navsari, and the anand fruits and vegetables. It is only then that the farmer producer companies will again come back into their options. And uh, uh, the other thing, of course, is that you have to appreciate that the cooperative, the way Korean saw them, came in perishables. And with due respect, neither Korean nor the NDDB were very successful in oil seeds in Saurashtra. For the very simple reason that they couldn't fight the Telia Rajas because you can stock uh, groundnut seed and groundnut oil and you can play the forwards and cooperatives are not that agile always. I mean, if there's a Korean, they are. Market yard of Unja. My friend Shankarlal Guru was there, and Sanat Mehta had set up a committee under me to look into the reform of the uh, rationing principles in those days. And he said, Saheb, Tame Shu Karsho, Tamarato, your secretary announces what is the purchase of groundnut and the the people who trade in groundnut, they take advantage of them. Says Marato, Munshi or Nati Khabar ke hum vechu chu ke kharidu chu. So the Telia Rajas in, in non-perishables are not that easy to supplement and I think control uh, strategic partnerships. Those are the kinds of issues one should look at there. Um, I don't have that much. I have some, a lot of other things, but uh, uh, I think it is wrong for the bureaucrats to push through these farm trade bills without consulting people like Ramesh Chand, who, as I said, has written a very good roadmap for the future. And that is why you have the Kisan on the road, because you you don't consult him, then you implement it. Look at the, I mean, this whole confusion about Arthias. Now, to say that the Arthias were important in Punjab, so you can make them important elsewhere in regulated markets, it's ridiculous because in the Punjab, Arthias were brought in by Dr. Manmohan Singh as agents of the FCI. Because the FCI's overhead costs were high, so the RCS could do it at a rupee a bag. The real RCS are there in Unja, in Rajkot, in the markets in Maharashtra. They are two very different animals, and they can exploit the farmer. And there is, uh, you know, between the 
artiyas and uh, the jat there is always the the jat hates the lala i'm showing you a picture of bapu a pencil sketch up there which has been done by my friend akusha it's a priceless possession of mine and bapu was very clear that you know his reform in the panchmahals for the adivasi was on cooperative principles and that still survives we were able to get monsanto to build up links with them and introduce the new high yielding um uh, maize but the thing is that it is the organization the institution which drives the system and that is kurian's message you can sup with the devil if you want as long as you are clear about what you do so he was willing to take on the indian cooperative he hated the multinationals but today if kurian was there he would let us if those multinationals who want to cooperate with us as some do in uh, irma when i was there john dole i think what was that tractor company and then kurian i think would go along with us so with that yeah, john did it john did yeah. ah uh, so more power to the vision of vargis john vargis kurian and i hope we will continue to benefit from his memory and his advice and the institutions that he has built and rebuild them as we go along thank you thank you thank you sir thank you a wonderful listening to you uh um, one one small query is there that uh, as uh, you were working and when this uh, cooperative companies uh, thing came up two issues uh, that uh, i remember people were uh, people like you have been talking about one was uh, that um, because of the registrar of cooperatives that was because properties are under state act and all the states uh, have different acts and and the registrar of cooperatives as a control site has to come to some central that was one 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 aspect of it second aspect that um, was there most cooperatives uh, suffered because of lack of capital formation access to capital and capital formation It was one hope that producer um, companies will come under if it is there is a central something, and it will be it will have much less interference. That was one under if it is under Companies Act, there will be much less interference. However, capital formation or access to capital, at which uh, we had thought at that time that will be, it has not been. What, what is your take on this um, part? You see, the best example of what you are saying is that now that farmer producer companies are important, the Ministry of Agriculture wants them to come to their ministry. The latest amendment that uh, they wanted tabled, I opposed it. I went and talked. I, I mean, I normally don't go to Delhi, but this time I went to Delhi and I talked to the the special committee which was looking into it, and I said no. these fellows i mean i am a great admirer of the ministry of agriculture but as far as these things are concerned they are you know they are absolutely in the the world of apes and it should remain with the ministry of company affairs they didn't like it but i am told that uh, the final legislation is still keeping it in incidentally the guys who didn't want it in the ministry of company affairs you know who they are they are the ministry of company affairs they say ye farmer wala chakkar हमको क्या करना है डॉक्टर and before i i i i i i just speak i i remember and that i told you at the beginning that the nudge that i i remember that um, i did it of course uh, he was uh, the member secretary of a very important committee which 
um, wanted to revive uh, the uh, cooperative banks revival of uh, cooperative banks uh, that was sir, my phd was on uh, my phd thesis was on district central cooperative bank and uh, rural regional rural bank so i i so <clears throat> I, I i had read it and i when he told me that about uh, vidyanathan committee he was member secretary it's a if I remember it correctly, sir, it was more than 200 pages report. Report was, and it is said that um, Dr. Thorat has actually authored it. <laughs> authored the he was as a member secretary. Of course, member secretaries uh, have to do a lot of writing work. Uh, and and um, so, sir, I invite you because you have been part and as as chairman about. I think your time self-help group uh, and uh, had had uh, financing of self-help group had come up and um, so i request you to do some light on this sir dr thora so you'll have to unmute uh, sir, uh, you'll have to unmute unmute uh, sir. Uh, uh, Respected Professor Alag and equally respected Professor Biswas. Um, um, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in today's seminar. In the Padma Purana, there is a saying that when Kalyuga comes, the old will talk of new things and the young will talk of old things. So it is fitting that Professor Alag has spoken of farmer producer companies which have yet to see their full fruition in India. And I will speak of classical cooperatives. <clears throat> Let me start with a story. But before I recount the story, I need to give you a short background. Exactly 30 years and one month ago, that is on the 24th of July, 1991, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, presented a historic budget to the Lok Sabha. Perhaps he expected the opposition to oppose the proposals to free the economy because he closed his speech with these words. Sir, I have come to the end of my endeavors. Tonight, I would like to go to the theater to see a film. Let the opposition be informed and let the assassins come for me, for I am prepared to meet their onslaughts. And then, quoting the famous song of the freedom struggle, Dr. Manmohan Singh closed by saying, Sir Faroshi ki tamanna, ab hamare dil mein hai, dekhna hai zor kitna, bazue katil mein. This was a historic speech because it began the process of liberalizing the economy. This process included a number of measures for the financial sector. One set of players in this sector at that time were the nationalized banks. However, the health of these institutions was poor. And as a result, they were not able to meet the credit requirements of various sectors of the economy. In an unprecedented move, the government of India and the Reserve Bank, acting in tandem, decided to step in and provide additional capital to these institutions so that they could lend more and thus make the economy grow. While this was so for nationalized banks, cooperative banks 
were not included in this exercise. Later, when some of the cooperative leaders pointed this out, the response of the government of India was that cooperation was a state subject and cooperatives were member-owned institutions. It was further clarified that if the health of the credit cooperatives was poor, then it was the joint responsibility of the state government and the respective memberships to do something in the matter. This was technically a perfectly correct answer, but it ignored the fact that what had come from the cooperative sector was a cry for help. Therefore, the cooperative leadership felt that the government of India was trying to duck its responsibility. And matters continued in this way <clears throat> till finally at the instance of the then agriculture minister and his personal credibility with the prime minister, the government of India changed its stand and the Vaidyanathan committee was set up to formulate a practical and implementable plan of action to revive the rural credit cooperative structure. <clears throat> I was then chairman of NABAD. And in my position as chairman, I was appointed a member. I, however, sought an interview with the then finance minister and requested him that I be appointed member secretary also. Mr. Chidambaram, caustic as always, uh, mentioned that I was far too senior. And in any case, why did I want to become the member secretary? And I told him that, sir, in any committee, it's really the member secretary who learns the subject. And I would like that opportunity. I had heard of Professor Vaidyanathan and was familiar with his path-breaking work on water issues in the rural sector, but I had not met him personally. I did so for the first time in the Taj in Bombay. After the preliminaries were over, he asked me, Dr. Thorath, we have been asked to suggest a plan for reviving the cooperatives. Can this be done at all? Some of the people I know have clearly informed me that this is a hopeless task. Tell me, what are the main reasons why cooperatives should not be revived? In the next hour or so, I briefed him about all the reasons. We discussed for a long time, at the end of which he said, you have given me all the negative points of the cooperatives. Now, Take some time off. Travel in various parts of the country. See the cooperative structure once again. Meet with farmers and then come and tell me whether there are any reasons for our committee to spend its time preparing a plan to revive cooperatives. I took my leave, traveled the country and met with him after a month. The first thing he said was, Tell me, Thorat, are there any reasons for the cooperatives to be revived? In reply to his question, I chose my words very carefully. There are many reasons why cooperatives have failed, I replied. But what I have learned from the field, sir, is this. If we do not help the cooperatives and allow them to die, then with their death, will also die the last hope of the poor farmer and the marginal and sub-marginal cultivator of this country. After I had finished, he was lost in thought for some time and then said, I agree with you, Yashwan, because whatever might happen, we cannot abandon those who toil to feed us nor, by the same logic, can or should we abandon the institutions which support them. 
you are the member secretary to the committee and you will finally draft the report. While doing so, approach your task with sensitivity, optimism and hope. And that is how the committee's report came to be written. Let me clarify that I might have contributed to it, but the report was written by Professor Vaidana. There is a growing perception around the world that the original rationale for cooperatives has ebbed away. And that in today's complex globalizing world, there is no meaningful role for them. To my mind, this is a misconception. At the very core, cooperatives are member-owned institutions and their rationale draws from the strength of aggregation. What do they aggregate? Cooperatives aggregate the power of people who on their own would find it difficult to achieve their business goals. They are member-owned, member-driven, and member-controlled businesses. They also represent a midway between the free market organizations, which provide goods and services through exchanges in the market, and state-owned organizations, which provide goods and services through state control. Do they have any relevance today? Over the last 60 years, one lesson that seems to have come across and has been learned globally is that growth is sustainable only if it is inclusive. A growth process that increases inequality lacks durability and indeed even lacks legitimacy, eventually threatening economic and social stability. There are many ways of understanding economic, uh, inclusive growth. One way is to understand it as a process where the poor contribute to growth and the poor benefit from that growth. If you accept this definition, then the cooperative system can become an effective instrument for inclusive growth and a useful platform for enfranchising the less privileged. Are cooperatives on the decline? Notwithstanding the above, what I have said, there is a stereotype view that cooperatives are on the decline. Though the study done by the International Labour Organization clearly points out that this is not so. Globally, the cooperative movement covers over a billion people generating economic activity, resources and jobs, and shows that two main factors have influenced them. The degree of government control and the extent of member power. In today's technology-driven globalized environment, it also matters whether and to what extent cooperatives are prepared to face competition. And this is where really Professor Alag's seminal contribution comes to play. In India, cooperatives cover a wide array of activities from credit and banking to housing comprising around 600,000 cooperatives. It is arguably the largest cooperative movement in the world, providing self-employment to a large number of people. There are stellar stories of success like Amun and Seva in Gujarat and the consumer cooperatives of Varnanagar in Colombo. But beyond these high profile success stories, the story of Indian cooperatives has been very patchy, very varied. In India, state policy and support have played a major role in the development of the cooperative movement. In subsequent decades, the Reserve Bank of India played a vital role in their development through the development of the Agriculture Credit Department and its refinance facilities. A landmark in the history of this movement was the All India Rural Credit Survey of 54, 
and the integrated scheme of rural credit, which was introduced pursuant to the committee's recommendation and which gave a boost to the country's cooperative movement. As the planning process got underway with Professor Alag and others in the planning commission in the post-independence period, building up a cooperative sector was seen as part of a scheme of planned development. Over the years, the importance increased beyond merely a business form to a broad-based development strategy to fulfill common economic aspirations of the poor and the disabled. Um, yet, despite its fairly credible achievements, cooperatives have steadily been losing business share. There are several reasons for the disappointing performance of cooperatives in the country, calling into question their viability and sustainability. These are well known and well documented. I have always felt, I mean, Vaidyanathan committee noted that the impairment in the cooperative governance was deep as the then state combined the role of the shareholder, manager, regulator, concurrent supervisor and auditor. Weak finances, growing NPAs, poor resource base also contributed. I have always felt that the cooperative structure is biased in favor of borrowers and depositors get an unequal treatment. Only borrowers can become members of the cooperatives. Depositors are either non-members or nominal members without voting rights. First, this goes against the concept of mutuality. Second, it is not fair to depositors that their money is being intermediated by cooperatives without their having a decisive say in the matter things are run. Other developments have also constrained the growth of cooperatives. More importantly, cooperatives have been unable to cope with the rapid pace of change in the financial sector. New products and services, application of technology and adoption of advanced management practices have certainly improved the efficiency and driven down margins in the financial sector. While other players have adjusted to these changes, cooperatives have lagged behind. This has pulled them into the vicious circle of falling business, poor governance, and weak human resources. Does this mean that cooperative institutions have no positive and have no not relevant today? The answer is no. Their vast network is a major strength. I believe that there is no other institution that has this depth of penetration for purveying credit and mobilizing resources. How then do we leverage on this strength of cooperatives, especially for furthering financial inclusion in the country? More significant besides the number is the location of these outlets, which is in, which is in, um, uh, in, in difficult areas, hilly terrains, deserts, and so on. So what needs to be done? If the inherent advantage of cooperatives are to be realized and they are to play a meaningful role in financial inclusion, I think perhaps five areas need to be addressed. One, improving professionalism in governance and management. Two, addressing their status in financial terms. Three, getting them to adopt technology for a level playing field. Four, improving their share capital base, and five, increasing their deposits. I remember once traveling in a state transport bus with a typical Maharashtrian Pahuna as my co-colleague. And we talked about cooperatives. And he said, we are not getting enough um, credit from the cooperative. So I said, why don't you keep your money in the cooperative? In which case, it will improve its borrowing power and you will get more money. He said, I will never do that. I will keep my money in a nationalized bank, but I will borrow from the cooperative. This state of affairs still continues. Before I close, let me raise 
five questions which I hope will engage the attention of the interface today. One, are cooperatives doing enough for financial inclusion? The basic philosophy of the structure is to ensure financial inclusion. And financial inclusion, as we all know, is not confined only to the remote parts of India. It exists very much in urban centers also. The significance of urban financial inclusion also lies in the fact that financial inclusion of the urban poor and particularly of migrant laborers provides a forward linkage to rural financial inclusion through the remittance corridor. This question is directed primarily to cooperatives working in the urban sector. Are they doing enough for financial inclusion? Have they cared to open large number of accounts for slum dwellers and migrant laborers? Second question, can cooperatives improve the supply chain to ease the inflationary pressure? In developing economies, where the supply chain management is generally weak, the layering of middlemen often creates an artificial inflationary pressure. Can a more proactive approach in developing sustainable agricultural value chain through the cooperatives help in suitably easing the inflationary pressure? Third, how to strengthen the democratic character of a cooperative? Democracy and open membership are among the cardinal principles of cooperation. However, the facts are low attendance of members in general body meetings and their poor participation in the election process. A governing, are governing bodies and associations working towards encouraging greater involvement of members in governance? A relevant issue here is that there are several instances of cooperative institutions which have become leader-centric. They do well under some good leaders, but crumble when these leaders leave. What is the mantra for institutionalizing leadership at the grassroots level? Fourth question, should cooperative banks diversify beyond basic bank? There is an ongoing debate on whether cooperative banks should restrict themselves to plain vanilla products or whether they should, like their commercial counterparts, diversify into offering exotic and complex products. This is a question which has been debated often. In my view, I feel that the main criticism against banks in post-crisis era has been that they have turned into becoming casinos. What is the lesson? In my view, the learning point is that there is value in cooperatives restricting themselves to being utility banks. And the last question, should there be social audit of cooperatives? Cooperatives is a social phenomenon. Banking is a commercial and a business proposition. Keeping in view these two conflicting dimensions of cooperative banking, there is an argument in favor of evaluating cooperatives on non-financial parameters along with financial parameters. Can there be such a system of social audit which would assess their performance in terms of social, environmental, and community goals. And so I come to the end of my talk. I am exactly as old as Free India. As a student leader, I was a staunch socialist and a nationalist. I continue to be so even more today. As I look back, I find that both the cooperative and the socialist movements were conceived as a revolt against the ills of the capitalist system. Some of the fundamental principles of both are the same. Both the systems emphasize human and social welfare. Both systems aim at the abolition of the profit economy. The keynote of both is to render social service and not to pander to individual greed. Both rest on the economic theory of collective action as opposed to individualism. Even the great Karl Marx 
recognizing the importance of the cooperative movement, once said, the cooperative movement is a great social experiment, which shows that production on a large scale can be carried out without the existence of a class of masters employing a class of servants. It is for this reason that my faith in the possibility of cooperation remains unshaken, despite the fact that the Vaidyanathan committee did not succeed in faith. I believe, as the All India Survey Committee said, that cooperation has failed, but must succeed. Once we internalize that despite all difficulties, all conflicts of opinion, all setbacks, cooperation must succeed, then one day in the distant future, our children and our grandchildren will learn that the only way forward for man and the planet that he inhabits is through cooperation and not through conflict. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. It, is, uh, uh, it was so educative. And, and uh, so we, we, we uh, come to the next uh, year of um, our uh, program that we have some questions uh, here. And uh, I think for both of you, the questions. Um, and this is, I open this to um, for more questions. If there are, we can take some few minutes. I think one is uh, for, let me go through these questions. Mm. Uh, this is for Professor Alag. Uh, that, uh, uh, this is by Professor Pipriya. She is asking, and uh, here, uh, just a minute, just uh, seems to be present. Uh, there are 10,000, it was just get this one. Uh, okay. There are so many changes. Uh, while the idea of cooperation remains intact, the legal identity takes different form for cooperatives and FPCs. Given these changes and a new ministry, how do you see future of academic institutes like IRMA while analyzing future of cooperatives? So, Professor Alak, this is for you. And Prithika, our faculty colleague, has asked you this question. Mm. That APC, her major question is that uh, this pharma producer companies and uh, the cooperatives which are registered under the state acts, uh, they are very different. And based on this, how do you, and there, there is now there's a Ministry of Cooperation. Uh, how do you see the future of academics like Irma while analyzing future of cooperatives? Um, I hope the ministry, I'm sure the Ministry of Cooperation will have the good sense to realize that uh, apart from uh, some of the uh, teaching and research institutions, which are attached offices of the Ministry of Cooperation, which are basically Delhi-based organizations and really don't do that much of research and fact-finding, but do more uh, training of a short-run kind, that uh, an institution like IRMA is of great importance to them, that actually the attempts that it made to set up similar institutions at the state level, is a, IRMA thinks of itself as a mother institute, it, it doesn't see itself competing with other institutions because when we looked at our long-term plans, we saw that there was a lot of demand for this kind of talent. So we had actually done a perspective plan. Uh, so these institutions uh, are there, more of them are needed. And the Ministry of Cooperation, I hope will um, at least give them support. I would expect also some funding. If they can't do it themselves, then they can arrange some funding from abroad. Unfortunately, sponsorship even by um, semi-official agencies abroad, like the Cooperative Union and so on, now requires a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, government approval. So I hope the ministry will expedite that because uh, I would expect that a good training institution of the Irma kind should raise at least around uh, between uh, a third to half of its resources itself and from cooperatives, but the others it should expect from the government of India and even from international channels. Korean himself had used uh, milk imports, the European Union's uh, milk powder imports to finance uh, Irma in the initial stages. So I hope the ministry will do things in, in that sense. I would recommend that a good uh, advisory committee to the ministry with people like Dr. Thorat uh, chairing it uh, could give them the kind of practical advice with which they could go ahead and do these things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm asking two questions for Dr. Thorat. Uh, the two different people have asked two different questions. One is, Dr. Shailendra has a question for Dr. Thorat. Uh, NABAD itself has been a top-down in its approach. That is one of the problems. Even whether it was implemented in a top-down manner. Do you have, how do you respond uh, to this? That uh... Uh, I respond as Mahatma Gandhi said in one of his times when he appeared in the court, I plead fully guilty. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not a laughing matter. Let me dilate on this. Mm -hmm. Cooperation started in the West yeah. as a bottom-up movement, especially in the post-industrial revolution, when the surplus labor of the agriculture sector in England and Europe had to go to towns and live under inhuman conditions where nothing was remaining for them except to come together, cooperate so that they could drive down prices. Cooperative cooperation started in the West as a grassroots movement. And it was not a grassroots movement in India. In India, the cooperation started because in the late 19th century, Deccan riots broke out, which were riots, agrarian riots, as a result of the agrarian distress, as a result of which the British government was very concerned about how to collect revenue. And it was as a viable alternative to the money lenders that they imported the cooperative <laughs> principles, put them in the form of an act, and thrust it on India in a top-down manner, in a Maibap approach manner. And this was carried forward by civil servants like us with the same mindset. Somebody has raised another question saying that why was why is cooperation successful in West and not in the rest of India? The reason, my friend, why it is successful in the West is wherever in India cooperation started as a grassroots movement, as a movement of the people and by the people in response to a felt need, their cooperation succeeded. Wherever cooperation was thrust upon people, whether pre-democratic, pre-independent India or post-independent India, it failed. And I plead guilty to this question. And I think uh, wise people like Professor Alak should really uh, prevail upon the government now. Change this mindset because it exists still in the administrative structure and it exists with all of us bureaucrats, and to, to understand that we are public servants, not government servants. It's the public who pays our salary. And therefore, yes, you are perfectly right in your criticism, and it needs to be corrected. 
one, one um, related question is coming up, and uh, it is, uh, I think, Dr. Thorat, uh, because of your experience with SHGs in Nabad, the question is this, that on seeing the success stories of SHGs in India, can SHGs be restructured to a larger extent to as a corporate? That's the question. That uh, all the SHGs that have been formed across the country, can they be restructured into a cooperative form? That's Professor, a, uh, let me, you know, when we joined service, we had this grand vision that whatever we plan must run from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. And we forgot that India is not a little country as in Europe. It is a subcontinent. And therefore, at the end of my, at, at, in the evening of my life, my wisdom is that we should take serious note of what is succeeding on the ground in a particular place. Encourage that rather than saying that in one cap should fit everybody. All the SHGs in India should become cooperative. What's the need? <laughs> if they are doing well, let them do well. I mean, that's perhaps what where I am today. I don't feel that we can ever have a policy which can run across India like this. But I would like Dr. Alag's wiser counsel on that. Yes, sir. So, look, this is that this idea of SHGs across the country, should they be restructured into a cooperative? What would be your take on this? Anyway, let's move on to the next question. He'll, he'll come back. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, no, because I, your question needs a lot of thinking. I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. It's another way. Then I can commit you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, one, one, another question from Professor Shailendra once again. Uh, it is for Professor Alak. Can COPS help overcome current agrarian challenge? And how to make them autonomous with state support? Now, this autonomous and state support, uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Run counter to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know, there are many kinds of funding mechanisms which can be devised where there's an arm's length relationship. I don't think it's a question of the mechanism itself. Uh, in education, we have the University Grants Commission, we have the Indian Council of Social Science Research, we have the ICAR, we had the similarly engineering education. It's the men who really man these organizations who give flesh to them. Absolutely correct, sir. The same story with cooperatives. I mean, if there is a Korean, things work in one way. If not, they become chamchas of the registrar of cooperatives. Uh, I get very disturbed now. I, well, maybe I'll, I'm thinking whether I should say this. The last time I was at the UGC, the UGC is in a way like a temple to me, you know. We used to go there, we would sit in a committee, we would give our advice. We were more or less sure that at the commission level, our advice would be taken. One would go to the chairman's office, say, Salam, and he would say, Are bad ke coffee to priyo, batao kya ho hai. And then we would go and have lunch, and you know, people were there from all over the country, we would chat. And now it's not like that anymore. It's a completely bureaucratic organization. The, the lunch that you get is in a dabba. You eat it yourself, looking over the dabba at your colleagues. Indian Council of Social Science Research in the days of J.P. Nayak was like that. He used to take a one rupee salary. And you know, if you, its office was in a rented premise. And if in that hostel, 
देर इज नॉट इनफ स्पेस यू सी यार यार मेरे कमरे में नीचे एक और बिस्तर लगा देते हैं and now it's got a big hostel of its own yes i see and yet it's not the same organization it doesn't have so it's the men who give life to such institutions which are the important issue i think they are important one can only repeat what a great oxford don had once said he said planning has failed planning must succeed so cooperation must succeed that's about all i can say i'm 82 years young and i believe that this message will go across because there are and i'm not being just facetious there are cooperative organizations and younger people who are making these systems work ground water use in very difficult areas institutions which see to it that as i mine the water i do starve you of water and that you know you learn to cooperate with each other as yashwant said technology measurement information the fact that non cooperation hurts both you and me those are the ways of moving ahead and institutions like irma and other institutions of course i i shouldn't be saying that shailendra himself is an expert on all of this so i think there is a catch he <laughs> wants to say what he what he is wanting to say himself i can only say read the biswasis and the, the case studies that they've done the books that they've done, the articles that they've done Sir, uh, one last uh, question. We can take this because uh, there are many, but this one uh, is important for both of you. Uh, on third uh, September, third uh, September, Irma is hosting a consultation on autonomy and independence of cooperatives. So, in the light of the new ministry formation and the Supreme Court decision on 97th Amendment. What are the two three points uh, that you would say that we should uh, forward? for discussion in order to provide energy to the cooperative movement uh, no they, they will have to be enthused just so so well uh, i'm sure the practical advice will come from yashwant i can only give one advice which is that autonomy and responsibility has to be at all levels some or the other we have developed a practice because we are a feudal society have been so for centuries and uh, as the great french social anthropologist louis dumont said and i think yashwant earlier was giving the same idea this is the only society in the world where the oppressed feel that it is their responsibility to be oppressed because that's what the caste system is all about Uh, i'm happy to be oppressed <laughs> my birthright to be oppressed now that is the system which we have to get out of autonomy and responsibility go together the autonomous and the responsible guy is not the lower caste fellow the girl child the minority fellow the sc the st because that's where the the laborers come from the peons come from the brahmins yashwant and me have also to have autonomy and responsibility in jnu i used to think and i always felt that that was true for irma where it was an easier lesson to give because of the traditions of argish korean although mind you a uh, korean was an autocrat i mean mm-hmm. there was only one rule with which irma was run when korean was the chairman and that was that the name of that rule was john varges korean and the first thing that i did was to establish rules and uh, tenures for everybody so i started with the chairman yeah. 
they very much wanted me to be there for a third term. I said, no, two terms of three years and then he goes out into the sunset. So autonomy has to be and responsibility has to be at all levels. The bosses, the board levels, the executive levels, and then going down. And then when the man at the bottom of the pyramid sees that these guys are also responsible, then, you know, they also feel the same thing. And Yashwan should talk about it because one of the things which I've always found very impressive, I was on an advisory committee of NABAD and I came back very enthusiastic about, about uh, Yunus Saab and I'd gone to Dhaka for a seminar. And they said, you know, you look at the, they have a whole repository of projects where autonomy and responsibility is built into a successful project. So I hope Yashwant will give some meat into these somewhat abstract statements that I'm making. Um, sir, I think, um, Professor, I, we can either answer this question in a, in a casual way or we can answer it with a certain degree of sincerity and integrity. Um, personally, if you ask me, I would like to think. Um, it's not something that we can see. My faith in cooperatives remains intact. Whether it is Professor Alex farmer producer companies, whether it is some kind of a transmuted self-help group, whether it is a classic cooperative, to me that doesn't matter much. That people should come together for mutual benefit to serve a common business end. To me that is the key thing. And I think, and I worry that we place too much confidence in markets. Maybe this is my own political bias, but I worry about markets because markets in the end are heartless. Um, I also believe as Keynes did that there are areas and spaces where the state must have room. So what am I trying to say? I am trying to say that Professor Alag and I were both, let me answer this question in an indirect way. Professor Alag and I were both um, co-directors in one of the Tata companies. And at one discussion, somebody made a comment. I think it was Nasli Wadia. Nasli said that what is that one thing in a balance sheet which explains everything about the company? What is that one indicator? If there are, there's a balance sheet and 50 annexes to it, tell me one thing that will explain everything. And then he answered it himself by saying that that one thing is the profit and loss. Because in that is subsumed the effort of the company, the effort of the management, the direction of the board, the effort of the workers, everything gets subsumed in that final thing. So what is that one thing in cooperatives which subsumes everything? And I would say today, that the quality of its governance. Here, when we talk about quality of governance, we tread on very delicate feet. Because do members really represent the board or are they proxies for interests, political and social? So I would say that if we can create 
can how to create conditions in which cooperatives can actually have their own governance i think if we can set that right many of the things would go but uh, professor uh, bishwas i would seek your uh, seek your permission to think about this and probably write to professor alak and maybe together both of us can give three or four points that can be taken forward but these are very serious things and if it is going to the the highest level in the country then we need to give it that kind of um, this thing uh, uh, sir one one thing that uh, we were uh, we laughed at it but it's very very important that state support and uh, autonomy these are two things like we have seen and uh, you know much better than what i know that in uh, district for example in district cooperative banks all the banks uh, cooperative banks it was the state wherever state had intervened uh, intervened it was visited by states uh, equity holding state has infused funds because it has infused funds it has to um, take care of its users and then the state interference has come to you how do you professor biswas uh, can i just give you one uh, and a half minutes of history yeah yeah in 1950 there was no other institutional structure which had the reach of cooperatives the problem at that time was their share capital base was low because their share capital was low their ability to borrow from the higher financing agency was low because they could not borrow from the higher financing agency they could not lend that is why we said state support and reserve bank gave loans to state governments to give loans to cooperatives what happened after that was it was just one step from contributing share capital to saying i am now on the board and now i am going to run the cooperative if we had stopped at that point of giving capital but not allowing the government representative to have a definitive state say we would have avoided the problem of bureaucratization of by itself historically giving share capital there was no other way coming to today you are talking about state support professor bishwas give or take a little if we wound up two thirds of the cooperative structure the country is not going to come to an end the point is that that this this dream of inclusion this dream that we have of everyone going together will that be realized and if that has to be realized then how it's not an easy question to crack you don't give state support the thing dies you give state support it becomes a government or department mm -hmm. so where do you draw the line between them it's, it's not easy but i'd like to think about it i confess i would not like to react off the cuff <laughs> thank you sir thank you wonderful and in fact uh, professor alag and uh, dr thorer um we are irma really indebted to both of you because we had um and uh, with uh, such a short notice actually both of you agreed uh, to participate in this and um, and 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 uh, uh, engaging and it is so delight i actually i have uh, we have heard professor alag earlier and it's always such a delight listen to you same dr thorat uh, it was it was uh, wonderful and i i also thank all the participants uh, those who uh, found some time to come and participate in this um ask question it is it is always difficult like our uh, when we were planning this uh, korean centenary said we we had thought of calling all of you physically that that we thought that by by uh, august september it will be fine and we can have uh, physical <laughs> conferences but it was uh,
Now, I, we don't know when we, it will be possible to physically meet, but I wish, sir, um, someday uh, we should uh, have a physical, maybe maybe November, we are planning you know, from uh, 26th November is Dr. Kurian's birthday. And uh, we are planning uh, some uh, physical activity on 24, 25, 26, three days from 24 to 26. And if it is possible, or if it is, becomes feasible, physically, we would, we will really be very happy to have you in Irma physically. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> and uh, because uh, now things are getting better till and unless the third wave and. Uh, Anyway, that's that's uh, in future. Thank you, sir, so much. And Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex. Sir, may I take your leave? You. Namaskar, sir. It was wonderful.